Welcome. In this video, we'll see how we can define functions in Haskell using pattern matching and guards. And we'll also see how to use where and let clauses in order to make our code more readable. I'll be roughly following this chapter syntax in functions in the Learn UA Haskell tutorial if you want to follow along there. OK, so here I am in Visual Studio Code. And as always, the first step is to open an integrated terminal in the place where my script is located, and then run GHCI. Now, the first thing we'll see is how to use pattern matching, which is a really neat feature in Haskell that allows us to define functions based on how the argument to the function looks. I think the easiest way to introduce this is just to give you many examples. So I'll start out with a particularly easy function that uses pattern matching, and then we'll move to more complicated cases. So the first function I'm going to define with pattern matching is called say number. And it's going to take a number, in this case an int, and output a string, which is the name of that number. Recall from the video on types that we write type declarations for functions before we define them. And the way to do this is to write the name of the function followed by this double colon, which is read as is of type. And then this here is the function type, which takes an int as an input and outputs a string. OK, so that's just a type declaration. And I now need to say exactly what this function does. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to divide it up into cases based on pattern matching. So I'm going to say that say number of 0 will return the string 0, whereas say number of 1 will return the string 1. And uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. So this is maybe the most basic example of pattern matching. So we just say what the function does on individual arguments. OK, so let's load the script. So I'm doing colon L in GHCI and then the name of the script, which is functions.hs. So I've loaded. It's now compiled. And now I can test my function. So I can do say number 0, and it returns the string 0. Or I can do say number 1, and it returns the string 1. So as you can see, I've basically defined the function on these two cases. Now you might wonder what happens if I try some other number aside from 0 and 1. So I do say number 2, for example. You see that I get an exception, which reads exception in this functions.hs. It says non-exhaustive patterns in function say number. So the problem here is that this number 2, I didn't say how the function is defined in the case when I give it to 2. So Haskell doesn't know, in this case, what the function definition should be, and so it complains about non-exhaustive patterns. The way to fix this is to introduce a catch-all pattern at the end of the pattern matching. So I'm going to say that say number x is equal to the string larger than 1. Okay. Now let's see what this does. So I'm going to reload the script after saving it and call say number 2. And it says now the string larger than 1 is what it returns. If I do any other number, let's say say number 4, it also says larger than 1. OK, so what's going on here? Well, the way pattern matching works in Haskell is that, well, you define the function several times with different patterns. And Haskell goes from the top to the bottom and tries to match the argument you give the function with each corresponding pattern. And the first pattern that matches, well, that definition of the function will run. So in the case where I call, let's say, say number with the number 1, it goes through the pattern. So it first checks 0. Well, it knows that 1 is not the same as 0, so this case doesn't apply. So it goes to the next case, and then it hits, say, number 1. And this, in fact, is a pattern that matches 1 because, well, 1 is equal to 1. And so it'll uh, run this version of the function and return the string 1. On the other hand, if I do, say, number 4, like here, it'll first check whether 4 matches the pattern of 0. It doesn't. Then it'll check whether 4 matches the pattern of 1. It also doesn't. And then it'll go to this last case here and check whether 4 matches the pattern of x. And x is a general variable here in this case. So it can be any integer. And therefore, it'll match the pattern and return the string larger than 1. Based on the explanation I give, you might expect that the order matters in which you define the patterns. And this is indeed the case. If I had, for example, uh, put this catch-all pattern as the first pattern instead of the last one, uh, 
you'll see already that Visual Studio Code complains here by underlining this in these orange squiggles. And if I hover over these orange squiggles, it says that uh, pattern match is redundant. So what this means is that, in fact, the first pattern, which is this catch-all, um, will always fire, and therefore these two other patterns will never be called. And this indicates, in general, that you've probably done something unintended if you're defining patterns that will never be invoked. So if I save the script here and I reload it again, um, you already see that during the compilation process, Haskell is again complaining about um, redundant pattern matches. Uh, the script will still compile, so it says, OK, one module loaded. But these uh, purple things, these are just warnings. Um, this is Haskell's way of telling you that there's something probably wrong, but it's not like wrong enough for the script not to compile. If for some reason you're writing code you're sure is correct and you're still getting these warnings, um, there's a way to turn them off. But in general, they're quite helpful because when you're defining, for example, functions that have these redundant patterns that never get called, probably it's not what you want. OK, so anyways, I've now loaded this uh, script. And I now can call, say, number with, say, 0. And you see that in this case, it returns the string larger than 1. So in fact, it's not actually getting to this point where it's checking the pattern against 0, because this first pattern here catches all um, arguments, in particular 0. So that's not what we want. So I put this catch-all term back at the end. But uh, for the sake of illustration, you see that the order of patterns matters because Pascal goes through them one by one from top to bottom. OK, let's define another function that uses pattern matching, perhaps in a bit more interesting way. So we're going to define the factorial function, which takes an int and outputs an int. So that's the type signature. And the way I'm going to define it is as follows. I'm going to say that factorial of 0 is going to equal 1 and factorial of n is going to equal, well, n times factorial of n minus 1, like so. OK, so what's going on here? Well, if we call factorial with 0, so that's basically the base case, then it returns 1. And if we call factorial with any other number n besides 0, so because 0 is the first pattern that we tried to match, this will get matched if n is 0. But if n is non-zero, then we go to the second pattern, which catches all other ints. And in that case, well, we return n times factorial of n minus 1. So you can see here that we're defining this factorial function recursively, because in the case where uh, n is not 0, so our argument isn't 0, we're calling the function again with the value n minus 1. So I hope you can already see how pattern matching and recursion will go together very nicely. And in fact, this definition here looks a lot like what you would write down when you're defining the factorial function in math. So the first thing up here, the type signature, basically is saying what sets the factorial function goes between. So usually we would write something like factorial is a function going from the set of natural numbers to the set of natural numbers. So here you would replace int by, well, uh, the natural numbers. But then you would do something like a case distinction. OK, factorial of 0 is 1, and factorial of n is n times factorial of n minus 1. So that's pretty much exactly like the math definition. OK, so after saving my script, I'll uh, reload it and uh, test this factorial function. So first, let's call uh, factorial of 0. OK, that gives 1. All right, what about factorial of 2? Well, that's 2. Factorial of 3 is 6. And let's check a really big number, factorial of 100. Oops, that's a 0. That's a too big number to be represented by ints. So here the problem is that factorial of 100 is probably exceeding the upper bound for ints. So I'm going to modify my function here to take, uh, make these integers, which don't have an upper bound on their size. I'm going to save, reload, and check whether I can get factorial of 100. And indeed, I can, it's just a really, really big number. If you recall from the video on types, I can check the max bound of int as follows. I can type in max bound of type int, and you see the max bound is this number, which is a lot smaller than factorial of 100. So as you can see, factorial grows like super fast. So in this case, it wasn't so smart to use ints in the definition of factorial. In fact, we can improve our factorial function a bit more 
by using type variables and type classes like we learned about in the last video. So instead of saying that factorial is like a function going from integer to integer, I'm going to say that I can use an arbitrary type A. So it's going to be a function that takes an arbitrary type A and outputs something of the same type. But here you already see that uh, Haskell is complaining because zero is not an element of any type A. So in fact, we're going to add a type constraint. Namely, we're going to want this type A to be of the integral type class. So it's supposed to be like a whole number. So you can write this like this. We put integral A. So that's uh, saying that A should be a whole number. So int would be an option or integer could be an option. And then we're constraining this uh, general type variable uh, in this manner. Now, if you want, you can write the type signature like this, or you can also surround the type class with brackets. Um, it doesn't matter if you just have one single type constraint. If you're adding multiple ones, then you need to surround them with brackets and separate them with commas. Okay, so let's uh, again reload our script with this new definition and see whether we can run factorial 100. And indeed, this works in this case. So apparently Haskell is smart enough to figure out that if you are going to use a really big number, then it should use uh, an integer rather than an int. As a next example, we're going to define a function that allows us to add vectors um, that have uh, numbers as components. I'm just going to say that this function takes two vectors. So in this case, I'm going to say a vector is a tuple of length two. So I'm just going to look at vectors of length two that contains um, doubles. So the first argument of this function is going to be a tuple, which has doubles in both its entries. And then the second uh, argument of the function is going to be exactly the same type. So it's also going to be a vector which has two doubles in each entry. And finally, the function is going to return, um, again, a vector which has doubles as its entries. So remember that uh, if we want to define a function of multiple arguments, the way to do it is to think about, well, on the rightmost side of this rightmost arrow here, this is the return type of the function. And then we put the input types of the function um, to the left of this rightmost arrow, and we separate them by arrows again. So this type signature here is saying we're taking two vectors, which each consists of pairs of doubles, and we're outputting one vector, which is a pair of doubles. OK, so now I need to define this function. So I'm going to say what add vectors, um, let's say x, y is, OK? So here x refers to the first pair of doubles, and y refers to the second pair of doubles. And OK, so how am I going to add these two together? Well, vector addition proceeds by adding the first component of both of the vectors. So I want to add the first component of x to the first component of y. That gives me the first component of the result. And uh, then I add the second components of each of the vectors I'm given to get the second component of the result. So remember that we have this convenient function called first, which gives us the first component of x. So the first component of the return vector will be first x plus first y. And then the second component will be second x, which gives us the second component of x plus second y. So let's save our script and reload it. And we can now test our function. So I'm going to do add vectors. I'm now going to give it two arguments. So let's try the vector that contains 1.0 and 2.5 as the first argument, and then the vector containing 3.3 and 5.6 as the second argument. And if I press Enter, I see that here the result is a vector 4.3 and 8.1. So 4.3 is 1.0 plus 3.3 and 8.1 is 2.5 plus 5.6. So okay, so this function works just fine. However, this definition isn't as elegant as we're going to manage to get it. So I'm going to show you how we can improve the definition of this function by using pattern matching. So I'm going to define a second version of the function called add vectors prime, and it's going to have exactly the same type signature. However, I'm going to now use pattern matching in order to define it. So I'm going to say that add vectors. And now instead of taking just an arbitrary element x and y, I'm going to say what x and y look like. 
So x is in fact a vector with a first component x1 and a second component x2, and y is a vector with a first component y1 and a second component y2, and now I've basically pattern matched these vectors. So this first um, pair here will match to the first argument of the function, and it will sort of unpack um, this tuple here and assign the variable x1 to the first element of the tuple and the variable x2 to the second element of the tuple. And similarly, this second tuple, which I pass the function, will be pattern matched against this pattern here, which will turn out to unpack the tuple in a way that the first element of the tuple is assigned y1 and the second element of the tuple is assigned y2. So in contrast to the case up here, I've unpacked my arguments and I've given the individual components of the vectors names already by pattern matching. And this will make the function definition much easier because now I can just say the first component of the result should be x1 plus y1, whereas the second component should be x2 plus y2. Okay, now here I've made a mistake, I've forgotten the prime, so uh, now everything's fine. Okay, so I'm again going to save my script and I'll reload it. And now we can test out this new version of add vectors. So I'm going to call it with exactly the same arguments, but I'm adding the prime here to use this newer version that uses pattern matching. If I press return, we see I get exactly the same result as from the first function, but the definition here is much more elegant because I've managed to define what the names of the components of these tuples is that I'm passing the function using this pattern matching. Okay. As a next example, we're going to see some more pattern matching for tuples. So I'm going to define projections on triples. So I'm going to just call these first, second, and third. So first will be a function which takes a triple, which has types A, B, C as components. And well, it's going to return the first element of this tuple. So that element will have type A. Now here I've used arbitrary types, so these are type variables. And the reason this is going to work is because we're just going to return the first element. So regardless what types are given here, um, well, I can always just give the first element of this tuple and uh, that'll be of the same type um, A. Now the way to define this is to say, okay, first of x, y, z is equal to x. So the pattern I'm using here is just Again, this arbitrary triple, but I'm calling the first element of it x, the second y, and the third z. And this pattern will again match any triple I give. And well, I'm now saying that I just want to return the first component, namely x. In a similar manner, I can write a function called second. This will return the second component of an arbitrary tuple. So it'll take a tuple with types a, b, c. In this case, because it's returning the second component, it's going to have a return type of type B. Now, second of this arbitrary triple x, y, z is going to equal y. And finally, I'm going to define the projection onto the third component, which I'll call third. So again, the type of the argument will be a triple where each of the components has an arbitrary type, but because I'm going to be returning the third, component, the type I'm returning will be the same as this uh, type of the, the final component of the triple. And so in this case, third of x, y, z is going to equal z. So I have now defined these three functions which take an arbitrary triple and project onto the first, the second, or the third component respectively. So let's save this and reload the script and test this out. So I'll maybe have a triple here for testing purposes, which has the string hello as the first component, the Boolean true as the second component, and let's say the character A as the final component. So first of this tuple is equal to hello as expected. Now let's check out second. Uh, that gives me true. And finally, if I check out third, uh, that gives me the character A. All right, so these functions seem to be working as intended. And again, we're using this pattern matching here basically to unpack the tuple that we're handing the function. So here we can start to see the advantage of having this strict type system in Haskell because this function is guaranteed to only work if we give it these triples 
So basically we can already say that this triple will have three components and we can say that well, we'll name the first one x, the second y, and the third one z. So because of this structure on the types we have, uh, we can somehow unpack these, these objects into their component parts. Now there's one thing we can do to make this function definition slightly better, which is to include wildcards whenever we're not interested in the specific value in our pattern matching. So here you can notice that in first we're only using the value of x and we don't care about what the value of y or z is. So in the function definition we're never using y or z. So in fact we might as well just not give them names. And the way to do this in Haskell is to put these blanks here. So what this does is it still preserves the same pattern we had before, but these parts of the pattern are just sort of not given any name. And this makes reading this function definition a lot clearer because we're saying we want to match something of the type x comma blank blank. We don't care what the blanks are and we just return x. And we can do a similar thing in the other two versions of the function. So I replace x and z here in second and I can replace x and y here in third um, using this underscore which will still pattern match but we don't give the specific elements their names. Okay. So reviewing, we've seen that, well, in the case of numbers, we can pattern match numbers by, well, just giving specific numbers and the pattern will match if the number is actually the same as the number in the pattern. And to cover the remaining cases, well, we just say X or N or some other variable. So that'll cover all other numbers because all numbers are just an X or an N and so on. And to pattern match uh, tuples, we can unpack them by giving their components names. For instance, if we have these pairs, well, then we can pattern match with a pair where we have two variables defined in the pair. And if we have triples, then we can pattern match with these triples where we give each component a name. All right, we're now going to see another type of pattern matching which occurs very frequently, which is pattern matching lists. So let's start out by defining our own version of the head function. So remember that head takes a list and returns its first element. So a general type signature for this function would be, well, we take some list of A's and then we return something of type A. This is sort of like the projection. We'll always be able to return something of type A if we're given a non-empty list. So in fact, we can define the head function for all types simultaneously. Now let's think about what kind of cases we should consider. Well, on the one hand, we could be handed the empty list and the way to pattern match the empty list is just to uh, give it like this. So these empty square brackets symbolize the empty list. So we can just pattern matching by checking whether the input type is equal to the empty list. So in this case, we want to return an error. So I'm going to write error empty list. And this error function here, what this does is it raises an error in Haskell. On the other hand, the case where the list is non-empty is pattern matched as follows. So I write x and then x's like this in brackets. And I say that the, in this case, we just return x. Now this might look a bit mysterious at first, but uh, remember that when we saw lists, we saw this cons operator, which is uh, given by the colon. So if I do something like one cons, two cons, and then empty list, this will in fact be the same thing as a list with the elements one and two. In fact, internally, this list containing the elements one and two is represented in this form. So every list in Haskell is basically the empty list and then the elements of the list iteratively put in front using the cons operator. Similarly, if I do like one cons and then a non-empty list, something like let's say two, then this also gives me the list one, two. So this pattern here, x cons x's, is basically matching this case here. So the x matches the first element of the list, and then it's cons with the remaining list, which excludes the first element. And in this case, I just want to return this first element, so I define head on x cons x's to be x. Let's save the script and reload and see whether this works. So I call head prime on, let's say, the list one, two. That gives me one. Again, the reason for this is that this list uh, 
is represented as one cons and then the list containing two. And so if Haskell matches the pattern, it says, okay, this one before the cons operator, that will be assigned to X, whereas this remaining list, so the one containing two, will be assigned to the X's. As a side remark, this notation here with the X and the X's is sort of a convention, but you don't have to name the things like this. I could have called this X and Y. The X's abbreviation is just useful to remember that here it's a list which might contain more elements. I mean, it might also be the empty list. And the X here is singular because it's just a single element. So this is a nice notation to remember what you're talking about. But in fact, you could call these any sort of variable name whatsoever. Okay, let's check the remaining case head prime with the empty list gives an exception, which now says empty list because that's what I wrote in this error message here. So this function also seems to be working as intended. All right, to get some more practice pattern matching lists, let's uh, write a really stupid version of the length function using pattern matching. So I'm going to call this function say length and its type is going to be as follows. So it's going to take a list of, with an arbitrary type in it, and it's going to return a string. So I'm going to just return a string, which is like the length of the list. So what kind of cases do we need to consider? Well, the first case should probably be the empty list. So I'm going to check first whether the list is empty, and the way to pattern match the empty list, as we saw above, is just with these empty square brackets. And in this case, I'm going to return zero because the empty list has length zero. Next, I want to define the pattern which will only match lists of length one. The way to do this is as follows. So I can do say length, and then I can type in, well, a list of length one. So I just have a list which contains a single element x, like so. And in this case, I return one. So this pattern here will match lists of length one. Okay, then we do the same thing for a list of length two. So I'm going to say, okay, if the list has this form, so it's like x, y, then I return two. And this pattern will only match lists of length two. And finally, I'll um, do a catch all case. So the length of a general list, which doesn't necessarily fall into one of the first patterns, so it's going to be something of the form x, x's, so this is going to be something it's going to return longer than two. Okay. Now I forgot to mention before that when you write these patterns here with this x colon x's, it's really important to put them in parentheses. Otherwise, um, Haskell won't recognize that you mean this entire thing as the pattern. Okay, so let's save the script and reload it to see whether things work. So let's start by checking say length on a list which is empty, so we get zero, okay, that's good. If I do it on a list of length one, I get one. And if I call it on a list of length two, like so, then I get two. So this list here will uh, pattern match exactly this case because it's a list with two elements. Now, if I call say length with a list longer than two, well then none of these first three patterns will be matched. But this thing here is a catch all term because every non empty list has this form. So any non-empty list is the form of an x cons with some list which might itself be empty. Okay, so let's run this and see whether it works. Okay, it says longer than two. So we've tested all of the patterns and so this function seems to be doing just what we want. Now you might still be confused a bit about this cons operator. So let's redefine this function say length using only the cons operator. So I think this pattern here is intuitive that it should be a list just with two elements and that this one should be just a list with one element. But let's redo everything just using the cons operator. So I'm going to copy this function definition and paste it. And now I'm going to put primes everywhere to define like a alternative version of this function. So the empty list you can't represent using the cons operator, but this list with one element you can, namely a list with one element is x cons with uh, the empty list, like so. Now you see here, VS Code is giving me a blue squiggly line. And if I uh, go, go and check what it says, it, it says, okay, well, we found that you're using this pattern x cons the empty list, why not just use the list containing x? So actually, and VS Code is recommending that I define the function as I did up here, 
but if we really wanted to use the cons operator, we could re uh, represent the list with a single element like this. And in a similar fashion, we can represent a list with exactly two elements using the cons operator, namely as x cons y, and then cons with the empty list, like so. And again, uh, VS Code thinks that this isn't the best way to do it. It's recommending that I do actually x comma y, um, as I had in the original um, definition of the function. So this is just like a refactor suggestion, and in fact, in this case, probably it makes things much more readable. Now, while we're at it defining patterns in a non-elegant way, let's redefine this last pattern as well. So the last pattern could be represented as something of the form x cons y cons whatever. Here, this whatever could be um, the empty list, but it could be something else. We know that it's not going to be the empty list because the empty list already was covered by this pattern. So here I'm just saying it's something of the form where we have two first elements and then, well, the last element we don't care about. It could be a list of length one, it could be a list of length two or whatever. Now you might notice here that we're never using the variables x, y and the x's and so on in our function definitions, which means that in principle we can also just fill in these variables with blanks. So I could uh, redefine this function in the following way and it would still work just as it did before. So let's check that this is actually the case. So uh, it compiles, so that's already a good sign. And then like say length with a list of length four will again give me longer than two. If I have something say with uh, two elements, it'll give me two. So because I'm not actually using these variables, I don't necessarily need to name them and maybe this looks a bit nicer, I don't know. In the end, this is sort of personal preference where you put blanks and where you put explicit variable names. Okay, so we've now defined a really stupid version of a length function, which not only does it not work for lists longer than two, it also doesn't return a number, instead it returns a string, so that's not very useful. So let's now define a proper length function. And in fact, this one might even be better than the built-in version because we're going to define it with more general type signature. So remember that the built-in length function um, always returns an int, which can be a problem because, um, for example, you can't then go on to divide directly the result of the length function by a number. That's why there's this from integral uh, function, which you can use to convert int to more general num types. But let's define our own version of a length function that already just returns something of type num. Okay, so what should the type signature here be? Well, it should take a list of a's as before, but in this case, it's going to return something of type b, but we want b to be a num. So I'm going to put a type constraint here, num b, and uh, we're not going to constrain the type of a in this case. So we should be able to calculate the length of any list of any type, but uh, we're going to return something that's a number. So now the way we're going to go about defining almost every function in Haskell is we're going to use recursion. And this always involves thinking about what cases you have. So usually it's best to start with the most simple case and then use pattern matching to define the simplest case and then move to more and more complex cases. And in the more complex cases, you can in fact use the definition from the simpler cases recursively. So I'm going to start by defining length prime on the empty list. So I think we can all agree that length prime on the empty list should return zero. Well, then the other case that remains is if the list is not empty. So I'm going to define a pattern which matches a non-empty list. And we've already seen that the pattern for this is x cons x's. So in this case, what should I do if I'm given a list that has at least one element? Well, I'm going to use recursion. So I'm going to do one plus, well, length prime of the remaining part of the list, which in this case is the x's. So let's try to understand what this function is doing. I hope that the base case is clear. So whenever we're giving this function a empty list, it returns zero. But if we give it a list that is longer than the empty list, so it has at least one element, well, then we divide the list up into two parts. The first part is the first element of the list, which we call x. And the remaining part, this x's, will be the remaining list. So everything except for the first element of the list. Now the way to get the length of this 
long list, which is x const to the x's, is to add one to whatever the length of this remaining part was. All right, let's save our script and reload and test this uh, alternative version of length. So first, let's test the base case, which is the empty list. So that gives us zero. That's not surprising. If I have one element, I see I get one. So let's think about what the function is doing in this case. So it's receiving this argument, which is a list of length one. Then it goes through these patterns. So first it tries to match this first pattern, but this list isn't empty. So it skips the first pattern and goes on to the second pattern. Now, in fact, this list does match the second pattern. So the element one will be assigned to x here. And what remains for the x's is just an empty list. So in this case, the x's are the empty list. And so the result is one plus length prime of the x's, or in other words, one plus length prime of the empty list, which is zero. So we get one plus zero is one. So that's why we get one as a return value here. Now, if I have something of length two, for example, a list containing two ones, I get two. So here it's a bit more involved. So again, first I try to match the initial pattern, but this list is not empty. So I go to the second case. Now, how does this list here match this pattern? Well, x will be assigned one, whereas the x's will be assigned the list containing the element one. So that's the second element here. Okay, and then I calculate one plus length prime of the x's. All right, but the x's are just the list containing the element one. So that's like our original list here. And we know that when we execute that, we get one. So I add one plus one, and so the result is two. And I can go on in this fashion. So I always remove the first element, and then I add one to the length of the list containing the previous elements. So these, in this case, it would be one plus the length of the list containing two ones, which we already know is two, and so I get three. So essentially, I'm removing one element at a time and always increasing my count by one when doing so. Now again, here I could improve the readability slightly by noticing that I'm never using this x, so I can just insert a blank here. So the only thing I'm really interested in is the x's for my function definition afterwards. Again, when we use pattern matching, we should always think about whether the patterns are exhaustive. And in this case, they indeed are, since we're matching either the empty list or this pattern here, which covers all non-empty lists. Okay, so I hope you understand how the recursion works in the case of length prime. We can now do something a bit more complicated by defining our own version of sum. So remember, sum takes a list and adds together all the elements of the list. So what should the type of sum prime be? Well, I want it to take some list of a's. And well, because it's going to add together all of the a's, the return value is going to again be something of type a. On the other hand, I need to be able to add the a's together. So I need to put a type class here. I want the a's to be of type class num in order for me to be able to add them together. Okay, so that's our type signature for some prime. Now, similar to the length prime, I'm going to start with the base case. So what should the sum of the empty list be? Okay, here we have to somehow make a choice, but a natural choice would be to choose zero. Okay, so what other cases do we have? Well, the list could be non-empty. So I'm again going to use this x colon x's pattern to match an arbitrary non-empty list. And well, in this case, what do we want to do? Well, we want to add together all of the elements in the list. So in particular, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this first element of the list and I'm going to add it to the sum of the x's. So sum prime of x's, this calculates the sum of the remaining elements of the list, everything apart from x. And here I'm now adding x to that sum. And so that'll give me the total sum of all the elements in the list. Okay, so let's test this out. So I'm saving and reloading my script. And I now call sum prime on the list, let's say one, two, three. And I get six, which is indeed right. If I add four, I get 10 and so on. So the recursion that's happening here is basically the same as in the length prime function, except we're not counting. So we're not just always adding one to the current length. Instead, we have a count, which again starts at zero. And then we always increment the count by the first element in the list. But we're sort of doing so in a reversed manner. So we're always cutting off the first element of the list and then 
adding that to the sum of the remaining elements, which will then be calculated recursively. As a final example, let's write a function that tells us what the first letter of a given string is. I'll call this first letter. Okay, so what's this going to do? It's going to take a string and it's going to return a string, which is like a sentence telling us what the first letter of our original string was. So let's think about the cases. So, well, it's possible that we are given an empty string. Well, in this case, we can't get the first letter of the empty string. So I'm just going to say empty uh, string as a return value. And well, then there's another case where I have a non-empty string. And remember that strings are just lists of characters. So the catch all term for a non-empty string is again going to be something of the form x colon x's. And in this case, I'm going to print the phrase, uh, the first letter of, and now I'm going to print the string. So the original string is just x cons x's, okay? So I'm gonna concatenate that to this, uh, to this string here. So the first letter of uh, this string uh, is, so here I put some spaces to have spaces in the final string, and then I concatenate this with, uh, well, the first letter, which I have to put in a new list because I'm using the concatenation operator. So perhaps this long concatenation is a bit confusing, but let's see that it actually does what I want. So I'm going to save and reload the, the script. And well, let's test the first letter on the empty string to start with. So here you see I return empty string. Whereas if I type something like hello, then I get back the string. The first letter of hello is H. Now let's think about why this makes sense. So here I'm concatenating the string, the first letter of, with x cons x's. So this is the original string, namely hello. So that gives me the first letter of hello up to here. Then I'm concatenating with is. So that's this part here of the string. And finally, I'm going to concatenate with a string which just contains the first letter. So here from the pattern matching, x will be the first element of the list. So in this case, it'll be the character h, which is the first element of the string hello. And I'm now putting this character into a list so that I can concatenate it with this string, which is itself a list of characters. Okay, so that's how you would get like the entire um, list if you wanted to in your function, you just use the entire pattern. Now, perhaps this isn't so elegant if you're always going to like rewrite your entire pattern, especially if you like are pattern matching long tuples and that sort of thing. So to avoid this, there's a nice syntax which allows you to reference at the same time a pattern, but also give a name to like the entire um, input argument without having to reference each component of the pattern. The way to do this is to write um, a variable name. In this case, I'm using all and then the at symbol before your pattern. So here it's saying all at and then the pattern. So the pattern uh, works just like in pattern matching as usual, but with this at notation, all is now assigned the um, entire pattern as a variable. So instead of writing the pattern here, I could also just put all, and this will do exactly the same thing as if I had written the entire pattern. If I now save the script and I reload it and retest the function um, with this new definition, you see it returns exactly the same string as before. So all that's changed here is that I've given this entire pattern a name, namely all, which I can now use in the function definition. Before moving on, let's do two exercises to check your understanding. So the first exercise here asks you to write a function that calculates the scalar product of two two-dimensional vectors. And you should try to do this using pattern matching. Remember that the scalar product of two vectors is calculated as follows. So you take the two first components of each vector and you multiply them together. And then you add the result to the two second components of the vector added together. 
And if you don't know where to start on this, as a hint, I would suggest you go back and look at the definition of the function we made, which added two vectors together using pattern matching. Okay, so that's the first exercise. And then the second one asks you to write a function that returns the second element of a list whenever possible. And if not, so if the list doesn't have a second element, then you should return an error. And you should do this by pattern matching on the list. So you should uh, use the pattern matching techniques we saw just before. Okay, so I highly recommend you give these a try on your own to see whether you've understood how pattern matching works. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So for the first function, which calculates the scalar product, I'm going to call this scalar prod. And I'm going to first declare the type signature. So what does the scalar product do? So in this case, it's going to take two two-dimensional vectors and the scalar product just returns a number. So my arguments are two pairs of doubles. So I have a double comma double. And the second argument is going to be exactly the same. It's again going to be a pair of doubles like so. And the return value will just be a single double because we're going to multiply these vectors together using the scalar product and that just gives us a number. Okay, so now the pattern matching is going to be exactly the same as for the vector addition function. So I'm going to pattern match the first uh, pair of doubles as x1, x2. So I'm unpacking the components individually. I'm going to pattern match the second one as y1, comma y2. And uh, now I need to write down the definition using these components of the vector. And well, the definition of the scalar product is just that you take x1, you multiply it, by y1 and you add uh, the result to x2 times y2. Now the way operator precedence works in Haskell, this will perform the multiplication first, but just to be sure, we should add some brackets here. And now I'll test out this uh, function. So let's try scalar prod of 1.0 comma 2.0 uh, multiplied with let's say 3.0 comma 5.0 and the result is 13. Let's see whether this is right. So I first multiply one with three, that gives me three. And then I multiply two with five, that gives me 10. And I add the two numbers together, that gives 13. So this is performing as intended. Okay, let's move on to the solution for the second exercise. So here we're asked to write a function that returns the second element of a list if possible. So I'm going to call this, uh, let's say, second list or something like that. And it'll be of the following type. So it's going to take an arbitrary list, uh, in this case, a list which contains things of type A, and it's going to return, well, the second element. So it's going to return something of type A. Now, the idea behind writing this function is I'm going to first try to pattern match a list that has at least two elements. And one way to do this is to use the cons operator. So we can have x, y, and then some remaining x's. So this will pattern match a list with at least two elements because I've explicitly said that it needs to have a first element x, a second element y, and then the remaining list can be whatever. So it could be the empty list or it could have additional elements. And in this case, I want to return the second element. So second list of this list here will be y. Okay, so this pattern will match any list that has at least two elements, but now I need to catch all the cases where I don't have two elements. So I'm going to do this by just introducing a pattern that catches all other cases. So I'm going to do second list of a blank. So the blank here is an arbitrary variable. I could also do second list of X or second list of Z. That'll just catch all the remaining cases. And in this case, I'm going to return an error namely that the uh, list does not have a second element or something like that. Okay, so if the list isn't of this form, so it doesn't match this first pattern, then indeed it doesn't have a second element. And so in this case, I use the catch all pattern to return an error. Okay, let's see whether this works as intended. So I've saved the script, I reload, and I run second list of, well, first let's check uh, for a list that indeed has a second element. So here it returns two, that's correct. The case where it has exactly two elements, it also returns two, that's correct. If I only have one element, I get the error. So that's good. And for the empty list, I also get the error. Okay, so this function seems to work as intended. 
Okay, let's now move on to our second topic for this video, which are guards. So guards are kind of similar to pattern matching in that you can define functions on a case by case basis. But unlike pattern matching, we're trying to check whether a certain Boolean statement holds or not. Again, here, it's probably easiest just to give an example. So we're going to define a function called grade. And what this is going to do, it's going to take a number. So in this case, I will say it's a double, and it's going to return a string, which is like the letter grade that you would get for a certain number of points on an exam. Okay, so the way I'm going to define this is using guards. So I'll write grade. And now I'll write, let's say, uh, p for points. And now I'm going to define this using guards. And the syntax for this is a bit strange if you see it the first time. So it uses these vertical bars. And basically, each of these vertical bars is a case which we can check. So p here is the number of points someone got in the exam. So I'm first going to check whether the number of points is less than or equal to, let's say, uh, five. And in this case, we uh, give the person, let's say, a fail. Okay. And then in the second case, we'll check whether the number of points is less than or equal to 10. And in that case, we give the person, let's say, a C. And if the points are less than or equal to 15, then we give that person a B. And finally, otherwise, we give the person an A. Okay, so here we see how to define a function using guards. So the guards are these vertical lines occurring here. And basically, these check different cases. So it's kind of like pattern matching. So Haskell goes through each of these cases, and the first one that applies will be executed. So that's the version of the function that will run. For example, here, if p is less than or equal to 5, then we return the string fail. But if p is strictly greater than 5, then we go and check the next condition. If the next condition holds, for example, if p is 8, well, then the next condition will hold, then we return c. Uh, but if the next condition doesn't hold, then we go further. And well, we proceed through all the cases. And here, this last case, otherwise, is uh, basically a synonym for true. So this case will always return true. And so this is like the catch all case um, where we return A. So if someone didn't satisfy any of these previous things, then it means that they have strictly more than 15 points, in which case we give them an A. We can check what the auto formatting is going to do. So if I auto format here, you see that it puts the guards a bit closer. Um, so it like puts maybe one tab of indentation for the guards. Another thing that's easy to get wrong is because you might be used to defining functions like using pattern matching, you might want to write grade p is equal and then put the guards. However, you see that in each guard, we also have an equal sign. So in fact, you don't need the initial equals here that will result in an error, as you see by this red squiggle occurring here in the first guard. So don't put the equals there. Um, what happens here in the guard is that you check this condition and if it's satisfied, then the equals here defines the function. All right, so let's test this out. So I save the script, I reload. Now I'm going to test grade. So if I do, let's say, grade uh, three, then I return fail. So basically what happens here is that three satisfies this first case. So in this case, the first case gets executed. On the other hand, if I do grade six, then the first case is not satisfied, but the second case is. So I skip the first case, I go to the second case, and then it prints C. And well, I can proceed in this way. So if I do like grade 11, it'll give me a B. And if I do grade, let's say 25, it'll give me an A because I land in this otherwise case here. As I said, otherwise, so this is just a synonym for true. So if I enter otherwise in GHCI, you see it just prints true. That's because this is just another way of saying true. The reason why uh, th this exists is because it makes reading these guards nicer. So otherwise is like the catch all case if none of the above cases fired. Okay, so let's see another example that uses guards. So we're going to define our own version of a max function. So remember that max takes two things that can be compared, like with greater or less than, and returns the one that's bigger. Let's think first about what the type signature for this should be. 
So it's going to take two things uh, of, let's say, an arbitrary type A, and it's going to return the bigger one. So it's going to return, again, something of type A. So the signature for this function should be like this. On the other hand, we'll need to be able to compare these elements. And if you remember from the types video, there is a type class for things that are ordered. It's called ord A. So I'm going to add that as a type constraint here in the signature. OK, so now what should this max function do? Well, so it's going to take two arguments. So it's going to be max a, b. And now I'm going to define some cases. So one case would be that a is strictly greater than b, right? And in this case, well, I want to return the maximum. So in this case, max prime of a, b should be a. On the other hand, the second case would be that a is less than or equal to b. And well, in this case, well, either a and b are the same, or a is strictly less than b. So in this case, I'll return b. Perhaps it's a bit nicer here to replace this explicit case here with an otherwise. So because the second case is just a negation of the first case, this is equivalent. But it's a bit maybe nicer to read. And also, it's a bit safer because Otherwise, we'll catch any sort of case. And if you try to negate the above statement, then let's say you got it wrong. So instead of, uh, so here's something that could go wrong. Instead of negating a strictly greater than b as a less than or equal than b, you could maybe falsely put the negation like this, right? So you say, OK, if a is strictly less than b, then I return b. And I define the function like this. OK, I'm now reloading. So it uh, compiles fine. But now this function has a problem since if I try to call it with two of the same value, then I get a non-exhaustive patterns error again. The reason for this is that, well, the, there's no case here where the two things are the same. Thus, it's usually a good idea to always have this otherwise clause. And it'll also make your life easier because you don't need to necessarily think about what the negation of this statement here is. So another thing that's worth mentioning is that guards operate similar to other um, expressions which you can write in blocks in Haskell. So if you remember from the first video, we saw this if-then construct. And there it was possible to write it like in this block notation where you had if-then-else and the then and else were in a, in a separate block. But you could have also written it in one line. And the same goes for guards. So it's possible to write guards like this. Uh, so you can put them all in one line. And uh, if I reload here, the thing still compiles fine. So this doesn't cause any sort of problem, but it's a lot less readable than putting things in blocks, especially if you have more than two. But in this case, you might maybe see where this vertical line syntax is coming from. So this sort of looks like you're separating cases with, with lines. So again, I would always suggest putting these uh, guards in a block. So you have to have some level of indentation um, more than the function is indented. And if you run the auto format, you see that it's uh, a little less than a tab stop that is used by default for the auto formatting. All right, so to check whether you've understood how these guards work, let's do the following exercise. So we want to write a function um, that returns uh, the absolute value uh, of a number. Uh, and we want to do this using guards. So I encourage you to think about this for a moment and try it out for yourself. I'll now give a short hint. So the hint is that the absolute value function is defined as follows. So the absolute value of a is equal to, well, a if a is a positive number. But if a is a negative number, then you have to return the negative of a, so minus a, which will then make a positive again. OK, so I hope you've uh, thought about this and tried that out for yourself. Um, I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So I'm going to call this apps prime, since apps is already a function in Haskell. So let's think about what the type signature should be. So it's going to take a single thing of type A, so, uh, and it's going to return something of type A. But this A has to be some sort of number. So I'm going to uh, put num A as the type constraint on this function. OK, so what is apps prime going to do to some x? Well, there are two cases. So in the first case, we have that x 
is, let's say, greater or equal to zero. And in this case, we'll just return x. So in that case, x is already not negative, so we don't need to do anything. And then the second case is that x is negative, okay? And in this case, I want to return minus x. Now remember with the negative numbers, um, we can just put a minus sign in front of a number and get uh, the negative version of it. But uh, we need to be a bit careful if we're like trying to do other operations in this at the same time. So then we need to surround this in brackets, but here this will actually work fine. All right, let's see whether this will compile. And we see that here we actually get an error and the reason for this is highlighted here, or also in VS Code, it's underlined in red. So if we go look and read the error message, we see that uh, it's saying that it could not deduce ORD A arising from the use of this uh, greater or equal than from the context num A. And then it gives us this possible fix here, which says that add ORD A to the context of the type signature. So what's happening here is that in general, um, because we're doing this comparison, we also need um, this a to be ordered. And apparently ord a isn't a subclass of num a. So not every num needs to necessarily be ordered. And so Haskell is complaining here that in order to perform this comparison, we need to be able to well order things. And so this should be added additionally as a type constraint. Okay, so let's test our function apps prime. So if I give it some non-negative number, so like three or zero, then it just returns that number. But if I give it, let's say minus four, so here I put it in brackets, I get four, so that's good. So it seems this function is doing what we want. So this oversight I had in the typing also gives you sort of a feel for how in general you will be writing type signatures for your function. So you'll basically be declaring the type signature like you want, but then sometimes you'll be missing certain type constraints which you forget to add to your type signature and then Haskell will tell you, okay, there's something wrong, but there's always this possible fix thing which tells you what you should add. If you're completely in doubt about the type signature of your function, you can also um, first write the definition and then you'll see that the type inference in Haskell will come up with a type signature for you. So I've deleted the type signature, but what Haskell is now suggesting, so this autocomplete feature in VS Code is now suggesting the, the inferred type signature, it's exactly the same one we had before. So another possible workflow is instead of first writing the type signature, you can also first just define your function. So defining apps like this, and then you'll get a type signature suggested and you can just go with that. But I think for sort of thinking about your code, it's probably good to first start trying to write your own type signature, then define the function. If it doesn't work, you can fix it. And if like you can't manage to write the proper type signature, then you can delete it and uh, get the inferred one from Haskell. Okay, in the final part of this video, I'm going to introduce you to three more constructs in Haskell, which are useful. The first one is the where clause. So where allows you to define variables sort of after the fact. I'll give you an example of where this could be useful. So suppose I want to calculate the absolute distance between two numbers. So I'm going to define a function called dist. It's going to take two numbers and it's going to give me the absolute distance between them. So that's the absolute value of their difference. Now the type signature for this is going to be similar to the apps prime function, except that I'm taking two arguments. So I'll take one argument of type A, another argument of type A, and I'll return something of type A. And I want to put the same type constraints as above. So I want these things to be ordered so that I can compare them. And I also want them to be num type so that I can subtract them from one another. Okay. Now, what does this function dist do? So dist, and now I'll uh, say x is the first number, y is the second number. Okay, so dist x, y is going to be defined as follows. So I'm going to check the following cases. So in the first case, x minus y is itself um, a non-negative number. And in that case, I'm just going to return x minus y. On the other hand, there's the other case where x minus y is uh, negative. So I'll write otherwise, but I could have also written x minus y is strictly less than zero. In this case, I return 
um, the negative of x minus y, which is y minus x. Okay, so this function gives me the absolute distance between two numbers. Let's save and reload to make sure that this works. So for example, dist uh, 3, 5 should be 2, but similarly dist 5, 3 is also 2. So this is different from just subtracting one from the other, I'm just giving the absolute distance between them. Let's also check the case where the two numbers are the same, then the distance should be zero. Now one thing we can notice here is that we're using this expression x minus y multiple times in our function definition, and this suggests that we can maybe write better code. And the way to do this here is with a where clause. So the where clause basically allows you to define variables after the fact, and a nice thing about the where clause is, is that it acts across guards in function definitions. So instead of writing x minus y all of the time here, and this thing could also be written as minus x minus y, I can um, basically write something like, let's say, diff here. So this is still an undefined variable. So here, if the difference is uh, greater or equal to zero, then I return the difference. And otherwise, I return minus the difference, okay? So minus diff, but now the diff is being underlined in red here because it's not in scope, so Haskell doesn't know what this is. But I can define it after the fact using this where clause here, so where diff is equal to x minus y, okay? So now this actually reads quite nicely. So I'm saying that the distance between x and y is equal to, okay, in the case where the difference between them is greater or equal to zero, it's just equal to that difference, and otherwise it's equal to minus that difference, where the difference between these two numbers is defined as x minus y. Uh, let's reload our script to see whether this still works. So distance between three and five is two, and between five and three is two, so everything's still fine. And this example is somehow representative because often we'll be using where clauses when we want to perform like certain calculations, which we don't necessarily want to include directly in our function definition. And then we can use where to define these calculations later. Now it's in fact possible to define multiple variables in a where clause. So the way to do this is again using this block indentation. So the second definition of the variable just needs to be at the same level of indentation as this first definition here. So let's say I just want to demonstrate this. So I uh, do let's say plus zero here and also plus zero here. And I'm going to define this new variable zero to be equal to zero. So I put this in the where clause just after here. So where zero is equal to zero. But now I need to make sure that uh, these two parts are at the same level of indentation in order for the code to compile. So let's reload this. And basically this will do exactly the same thing as before because I'm just adding zero to the result. So dist 25 is still three. Um, but you see we can define multiple things in the where clause. Now let's see what the auto formatting does here. So by default, when you have this situation where you would put things in the block, you see the auto formatting puts the block like on a new line and uh, has the things at the same level of indentation. If you don't have them at the same level of indentation, you see there's already a red squiggle occurring here. The problem is that the Haskell doesn't know how to parse this block if it's not indented at the same level. Okay, so the next topic we'll look at is similar to where, it's called the let binding. Um, there's a basically different use cases for each. So let also allows you to define variables in an expression, but you have to say what the variables are equal beforehand. For this, we're going to define a function called cylinder, which calculates the surface area of a cylinder given its radius and its height. I'm going to just do this with doubles. So I'm going to take a double, namely the radius, and I'm going to take another double, namely the height, and I'm going to return a double, namely the surface area. Okay, so now let's define this function. So cylinder of rh, so r will be the radius and h will be the height, is going to be, well, I can write down the formula for the, the surface area. So let's think about what this is going to be. So on the one hand, there's the tops and the bottoms of the cylinder. So the tops and the bottoms are each given by the formula pi times r squared. So that gives me the area of a circle with radius r. Now I have two of them, so I'm going to write two times this, this top, top area. And then I have to add the side area. And well, that's going to be the height 
times the circumference of the, the, the top. So the circumference of the top is given by 2 times pi times r. So remember that pi is already defined as a constant in Haskell. Okay, so I can save this. So this is a totally valid definition for this uh, cylinder formula, but you can see it's not very nice. So let's first rewrite it using a where clause. So the idea is to say, okay, um, in fact, uh, this thing here defines a top area, okay? So I'll say this should be top area where well, top area is equal to the formula I had before. And okay, and this thing here is the side area. So I'm going to cut it away and write side area here instead. And right now I need to put it at the same level of indentation and call this side area, like so, is equal to that. And now I put uh, this at the same level here and I can do the auto formatting to make it a bit nicer, like this. Okay. So here we see an alternative definition for the cylinder formula, which is now much more readable because I've given these things names. So we now know that this is the top area and this is the side area. And we know where the individual components of the formula have come from. Okay, so that's how we would do things using where. Uh, I'm now going to define the exact same function using a let clause to illustrate the difference. So I'm going to call this cylinder prime and with a let clause, we have to say what the things are before the expression. So in this case, I'm going to have the same expression as before. So two times top area plus side area. But now I'm going to say let, and now I put my uh, variable definitions. So here again, these two things need to be at the same level of indentation. So the construct is called let, and then you put the definitions of your variables, and then you say in, and then you put the other expression. Okay, and here it's also good to put the second thing at the same level of indentation. In fact, if I auto format it, um, you see it kind of uh, puts these things at the same level, but puts the let and the in at different levels. But okay, I liked it the way it was before better. So here now I need to just make sure that these two parts are at the same level of indentation and uh, here it doesn't really matter because there's only one line. Okay, so you can see that the uh, using this let and in is similar to where, except that we've somehow reversed the order. So here I'm first saying, well, let top area equal this and side area equal this in this expression, namely two times top area plus side area. Now I'm not going to discuss too much what the differences are here. So one difference is that where can span across guards. So we saw that happening here, but the let cannot. So in contrast to where, let is actually a whole expression in itself. So this entire block here just evaluates to basically the formula I had written before. So somehow this let in is like a thing where you substitute these things in for the corresponding variable names directly in the expression. Now because these let bindings are just expressions, you can basically put them anywhere in your code, which isn't the case for the, the where clause. Okay, so that's all I want to say at the moment for these where and these let bindings. We'll see more examples of these in future and hopefully you'll gain some intuition for where you would use which one. The final topic we'll cover is so-called case expressions. So these are like general um, expressions you can use for pattern matching that aren't necessarily part of function definitions. In fact, the pattern matching that happens in function definitions that we saw in the beginning of the video is equivalent to using case expressions when defining functions. The syntax for these case expressions is as follows. So you start with the keyword case, then you put your expression, then you put the keyword of, and then you can do pattern matching on this expression. So you then put some patterns and then you put these arrows and then you put the result for each uh, pattern and these patterns have to be indented at the same level. So I put a second pattern here and uh, then put the result for that pattern and so on. Okay, now this is all red underlined because I haven't put it as like part of a function definition, but this should uh, give you the basic uh, structure of these case expressions. So for illustration, let's redefine the head function using this case expression. 
So I'm going to say head double prime of x's is equal to case. And now the expression I'm going to pattern match is exactly this x's, which is the argument for this head double prime function. And now the first case I want to check is the empty list. So in the case of the empty list, I want to return an error. So I write error uh, empty list. And then the second pattern I want to check is, well, if it's a non-empty list, so the pattern is of the form x and then some blank. Okay, so this is a list which has at least one element. Well, in that case, I return the first uh, element of this list, so I return x. Now we can already use the suggested type signature for this function, head double prime, so it's just a thing which takes a list of a's and returns an a. So that's exactly like head prime. In fact, this definition like this is exactly equivalent to uh, head prime, where we used pattern matching directly to define the function. So Haskell parses the pattern matching we had where we like write head double prime of empty list is equal to error empty list, uh, head double prime of um, x colon blank is equal to x. So that's the same as uh, this thing here. Again, these case expressions are expressions. So basically, they always evaluate to a specific value. So you can put them anywhere in your code you want. So if you want to do some pattern matching in some weird place in your code, you could consider using one of these case expressions to do it. Okay, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. So we've seen how to use pattern matching and guards to define interesting functions in Haskell. In particular, we saw that pattern matching works very well together with recursion. And in fact, most of the functions we will define in Haskell will use recursion because we don't have things like for loops. Then we also saw some ways we can make our code more readable with where and let. And finally, we've seen this case expression, which is sort of a more general version of pattern matching, which you can use anywhere in your code. Now, I'm aware that for some of these, we haven't seen so many examples. In fact, there are are even more ways in which you can use like the where clause because you can not only define constant values like we did um, here, but in principle, you can also define functions in the where clause. So you could again define like diff not just to be a constant, but you could define it to be a function of uh, some other values. And then you could there again use pattern matching in your where clause and so on. But I think it's best to just learn these things as they crop up when we write more code. For now, I think you have enough material to be able to start writing your own functions and also understand the functions we'll be writing in the remainder of this course.